is here in Hot Springs today to, to take all of our questions and, and be with us. So please, everybody stand and give a big round of applause yeah. for it. DNA.com, and um, I have relatives from Arkansas. Woo! Oh, wow. Oh, wow. They're all my cousins <laughs> from the early 1700s. Can you imagine? Wow! Oh, wow. Oh, that's a good gene pool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I won't be marrying my cousins. So <laughs> that's a good thing because some of y'all are fine. Where is he? This one, one brother came in named Rodney in a purple shirt. <laughs> to come here. Um, I'm thanking the, the companies that brought me here. I'd love to, in other words, thank the audience because without the audience, there is no actor. And so if anybody thinks that they don't need you, you don't have to show up and just see what happens. The humility, the narrative will get better and less redundant. And that's what we need. We have so many incredible stories, you know. So I, I, I and, and I just finished a movie with Diane Keaton. Yeah. She was on my bucket list. <laughs> Rhea Perlman, Perlman, Jackie Re Weaver. And let me tell you, it's a hoot. <laughs> Diane Keaton is, is absolutely amazing. And it's called Palms, P-O-M-S. Um, for pom-poms. Yeah. You can, you know, figure it out later. I don't want to give it away. Down, so why are you going out there telling everybody my business? You know, but she's funny. She is, you know, you want to work with actors who are in your age range as well and share each other's narratives, you know, of how and why we are doing what we do. And we, I'm telling you, we drink red wine with ice in it. <laughs> We're having, she's giving a, a, a party, for a cast party. I'm way on the other side. She's way on the other side. And we hold up our glasses to cheer. And nobody puts ice cubes in their red wine. <laughs> you know, unless even it wasn't boxed, it was expensive. This was $30. Like, wow, that $30 a glass? What's Diane Keaton? She can handle it. <laughs> she won two Oscars. I think she can make it. Uh, but, but it was like, we held over and said, oh my God, we're joined at the hip. We're both put ice in our red wine. Yeah. You know? So I was like, wow, cuz, you know, we're related. And we had so many things in common um, children, animals, people, just their careers. And, and so it, it, it was just extraordinary to meet her and Rhea and Jackie. Um, and the other actors in the show. And then before then, I did um, a, a series that's going to be on Fox. We start filming it in February called Bless This Mess with Jack Shepard, um, Ed Begley Jr., and Lake Bell. And they come to visit me in Nebraska. <laughs> I won't tell anymore. I won't deal with it. You know, they're going to have their little fights, but they got to come see Mama G. <laughs> and Mama, I own this little store that's like a bait shop, lumber yard, you know. Uh, you got to come to me for your tools and your stuff. So it's a, it's a funny show. It really is wild because I live in an environment that's very much like that. And I've embraced them and, and uh, they talk about them being rednecks. I said, look at this. My neck is redder than yours, you know. So, <laughs> she is a real redneck. <laughs> you know, and I have more guns than they do, so it works great. <laughs> you know, 30 out of 6 is I rode draft horses, and my family's from Wyoming. Oh, have any of y'all done that? AncestryDNA.com or 23? Oh, drink before you do it. <laughs> and I just want to tell you this. Um, we had a family gathering, 
And I was sitting at the table in my mama's kitchen. Everybody comes to the kitchen because everyone's cooking and sampling and drinking and stuff. It's great. Neighbors, so I go, Mom, guess what? Daddy Ray only had one daughter. So the sister who was born ahead of you, um, Marky had two daughters. My grandmother had two daughters. Daddy Ray had one. Do the math. My mama said, what? I said, Mom, you're the only daughter. So the estate is yours. <laughs> <laughs> she went, what? <laughs> what? And she's still doing that today. It's a week later. <laughs> what? You mean I'm the only child? Yeah, Mom, you're the only child. So all these other people, they, you know, send them out the house before they start stealing. Because <laughs> you know, they always show up at a funeral, you know. <laughs> you know, and they sit on the sides. So on this side is the, the man, whoever's dead is on this side, and this side is whoever's alive on that side. You know, so it was interesting to see. All the, so now everybody's going on ancestry.com. It's going, they just blew up. You know, from all the things that were happening. So, with that said, and I know you want to ask questions, and you, they want to ask questions, and I'm still single. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, um, but as in, and I, I speak John Deere. <laughs> I have John Deere equipment. It's green and yellow, and I ask them, does it come in pink? You know, I was I was uh, on a lot of Craftsman, you know, Sears Craftsman, but it's just black and red. It's boring. Yeah, I don't like black and red. <laughs> no, I like pink. <laughs> but it's, New Holland is blue. John Deere is green and yellow. Uh, Mahatra is red. Kubota is orange. You know, Kate, Caterpillar, Toro. I think I'm the only woman that can name 10 tribes. Yeah. <laughs> and then still be called Urban. Hey. Still be called New Jack Swing. Uh, uh, you know, so. Uh, but it, it's about all of us enjoying all the different cultures. You know, you don't have to live in it. You know, you like to eat it. You know, there's going to be some good food. But the cultures. Our microcosms, our, our cult, microcultures, are so incredible. Because when Snoop Dogg uh, and, and Dre were having a concert at Fiddler's Green in Denver, they said, we're just going to have a one night, Pam. I said, one night? Is that all? They said, yeah. Is it, there's not enough black people in Denver. I said, it ain't about the black people, it's about the green people. <laughs> and so when Snoop announced that the first night sold out within minutes, they said, who bought those tickets? I said, people who love different cultures. Yeah. They, Snoop and Dre and Exhibit had a three-day concert at Fiddler's Green, sold out. And so I sent over a guy, Big Jim, he has a barbecue truck in Parker. It's predominantly maybe, you know, 99% white people and me. <laughs> and it's, it's not about color and race. It's, about food and flavor and culture and music and listen to each other's, you know, and you wonder, and you'll know if it moves you, because I like country and western music. I like Sheryl Crow, okay? Uh, leaving Las Vegas and are, are you strong enough to be my man? Come yeah. on now. <laughs> and then, then I go to um, Formation, Beyonce, um, and I just, and then I like my, you know, martial arts, Asian music. I like so many things that make me happy. You feel, you, you feel it in your heart and you don't even know why that you eat some raw fish. <laughs> and, uh, we ain't never ate raw trout. <laughs> a, a, a crappie or bluegill, it wasn't yeah. raw. You know, we fried it. You know, yeah. We ate it and we seasoned it. You know, so they got me eating some raw stuff. And then when I saw that worm, and I was like, mm, I'm, done. I'm done. It got to be cooked. There's a reason why them cavemen built that fireplace. And they got to do that meat and bananas and stuff, plantain now. Um, so anyway, sidebar, um, my life has been enriched because of you. Every time you come here, to help us build our brands. That's why I'm on uh, Brown Sugar. I am the, the streaming service for Bounce TV. And what we do is we continue to, uh, once the red carpet is over, 
we have to continue without a paying PR people brand recognition, which there's they have 250 movies, and there are movies that many of you have not seen with Sidney Poitier, James Earl Jones, Richard Pryor, um, oh God, Miles Davis, um, Car Wash, the directors, writers, producers. There's the branding that when you support that, then there'll be another Black Panther. Because everyone marvel, marvel. And then look at Stan Lee, my, my BFF. <laughs> we took pictures together. He put in his, he said, I want all the women to be like Pam Greer. <laughs> and I said, does he yeah. really know <laughs> that I'm a geek? <laughs> and just and if I've been pushed, he didn't know my narrative. I hadn't written my autobiography until 2010, and because of it, at six years old, I was attacked horribly. And my grandfather, Daddy Ray, who's going to be played by Idris Elba, uh, and uh, yeah, he's going to be a great Daddy Ray uh, in my autobiography, Foxy: My Life in Three X. And Jay Farrell's going to play Richard Pryor. We're going to we're looking for Tamara Dobson. We're looking for who's going to play me. We're looking for who's going to be Freddie Prince. Um, all of the people, I'd like Ryan Reynolds to play my agent, John Gaines, at the time, who had me, Richard Pryor. Uh, he had me, Richard Roundtree, Tamara Dobson, Steve Martin, and Isaac Hayes. And he had, and he was building our brand. So I was doing Roger Corman movies. This is an introduction. Roger Corman movies. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Sam Arkoff, America, Coffee Foxy, Brown and Sheba had a three picture deal. And then um, Friday Foster. Then I started going into mainstream. When John said, "You, we've done all of these. Now we take you to mainstream, so that everyone can understand." But they prepare to un understand your your jargon, your music, your dance, your culture, your bell bottoms, your afro. And so that's what you do. And when I was bringing to the fact, I said, "John, let's go see, let's go see some Jackie Chan movies." Mm -hmm. Bride with white hair. Drunken Master One and Two, well, we, and then the, War, the Hudlin Brothers. I bumped into them; they were seeing them as well. Bonnie Curtis Hall, Sylvester Stallone. We were all bumping into each other in the theater, going, "We all like martial arts, Asian martial arts, Japanese movies, culture that, what? you know, all that kind of stuff." Um, and I learned martial arts on Air Force bases, which helped me to understand how to protect myself because I didn't know what was happening to me at six. It happened to me again. I had another attack at 18 and a third one, which made me take the Roger Corman movie to get out get out of America and find out who I was because I got tired of being attacked, which is a part of the Me Too movement, which is today. When I say Me Too, I was saying Me Too times three. And what took you so long? But it was because now it reached to a point where sometimes I, I know you've heard the squeaky wheel gets the oil. After a while, where it's getting lots of oil now. Because we want to feel that our daughters are safe, our babies are safe, our sons are safe. People are safe. And then we're bringing, trying to say, okay, manners, dignity, and boundaries. You know, there's things that, that kind of gotten lost. So we're bringing them back. And then, you, you know, if we have the reality that's in our, 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 our real life and then the fantasy of movie, let that stay over there because we're going to have movies that are going to scare you to death. They're going to be violent and our fantasies and there are our marvels and our superheroes. And we don't have that in our real life. We just have us. We just have to say, no, that's inappropriate. Don't say that. Because when I speak to, and I, I have to come out like this is to me, for me to thank you for supporting my career for 50 years but for supporting the film industry. But whenever there's, here she can, whenever there's a, a, a forum like this, I always ask, are there children in the audience? Because I do respect children and I don't want to use profanity. I'll find a way to say caca <laughs> or doo doo. I will find a way, here comes a little five-year-old. Now you know I got the curve and y'all gonna get mad. <laughs> Can you take your son to have a pizza? Because we want to hear the good stuff. We're going to hear some stuff from him, and now we, she can't say it. You know, so, and I will curb it because I will respect 
children. I'll find a way. So go ahead, ask ahead. Okay. And I, I won't I won't say shit fuck again. No. Okay. Come on, let's turn around, let's sit on it. <laughs> yes, right? No, you can see me if I sit down. I couldn't see okay. you when you were speaking. Oh, I see. That's why I was doing yes. Okay. You know, stand up. I, you, you was thinking like, I don't know how to dance. <laughs> I, don't dance I don't dance the moves. I do like hip hop, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so there will be uh, the opportunity for you guys to ask questions. Um, I'll maybe I'll do one question for me and one for you guys, uh, and then if you just project, I can always, always just repeat it through the microphone. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the first question I had is when you were making Jackie Brown, <laughs> um, uh, when you were promoting that, you did a uh, an interview with Michael Keaton. Uh, for interview magazine. That's Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> he should have won an Oscar. Yeah. He was brilliant. He was brilliant. Has he won an Oscar? No, uh, I don't think he had. He almost. He took, he, 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 no, he burned man. He didn't. He was taking the. He's taking a speech out. And then all of a sudden they called somebody else and the camera was on him. He went. I was hurt for it. I was hurt for it. She's twelve. <laughs> well, so well, one of the things he said in the interview with you is that you have the ability to uh, detach yourself from your career and your uh, personal life, and you responded by saying that you're brought up to be self-sufficient and accept uh, as a member of the human race. There are certain things you have to go through. I always thought that um, that not living here in Hollywood was a way of showing that I'm afraid that I'm not afraid of losing my career. I'm afraid of losing me. So can you, can you talk about just sort of the process of sort of like having like you live in Colorado now. You, you, Never lived in Hollywood proper. Um, I lived in hotels for yeah. 50 some years. Room service is great, except for it's highly salted. Oh. Um, so. <laughs> Be a little slow. <laughs> Did you have your coffee today? So on, the phone, on the phone, he asked me a hundred zillion questions. Our interview went like eight hours. <laughs> That's longer than an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> she don't know what that is. By the way, as this 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 um, progresses in the next 15 minutes, um, I'm older than mostly everyone in here. Oh my goodness, I am older than all of you. No, 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 no. Oh, there's my friends over there. So I, I just want to tell you that they, everyone asks me, "Well, you're going to do? Are you going to do sex scenes at your age? And are you going to do love scenes and things like that?" And I said, mm -mm. I said, first of all, when you're younger, your your orgasms are, you know, faster. You can have, you know, five, six, seven in ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, someone's testifying over here. <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you, when you get to my age, an orgasm is like seven hours. <laughs> it's so long that you think you're gonna have a heart attack. So I don't advise it when you get over 65. When you get to 70, just go clear, you know, because I'm not, t I'm, I'm no, not, mm -mm, I, mm -mm. I'm just going to be old grandma, bad grandma with Florence Henderson. I'm just going to be a bad old grandmother. I'm not going to even try to kiss anybody on the screen. <laughs> no. I tried, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and it does last seven hours. <laughs> it hurts all day. My t it hurt to my teeth and my toes. Let me tell you, he's testifying right here. Damn, I remember that one. I thought when I got to turn 60, I could get it like over like that. And then with that Viagra, that blue pill, four hours? Ooh. Oh, hell no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, I'm just, I'm just warning you. I'm just warning when you go to ER, and they tell you, what were you doing? That's one of the morning at, at orgasms I had this morning, <laughs> eight hours later. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about, uh, you, you said that one of the first movies you ever saw was Godzilla, and that while your uh, relatives were obsessed with art, they were scared, you were obsessed with how the costume was put together. And I also know that when you uh, first got to California with UCLA, you were taking acting classes and you were doing work on a senior film production. So why didn't you ever go back to the production side of behind the scenes characters? Well, that's a six part question. Okay, first of all, I was a student. I couldn't get into UCLA because it was too expensive. So I thought if I stayed in California, I'd become a resident and I can get in. 
Um, I like production. And when I started doing my first movie, which was the Roger Corman movie that I, after the third attack, I said, I just want to go away. I'm tired of being attacked. I just want to go to school. I just need to make money. I, just need to, I only have two years to stay out here or I have to go back home. So I did the first movie. And after I did the first movie, they offered me a second and a third. The second one was Twilight People, where I played a Black Panther. So I already did my Wakanda. <laughs> and I already played my Black Panther with teeth. I was crawling in the back cave in the Philippines with teeth hanging out my mouth. But it was tuition. And I said, I probably won't be an actor. I won't do this again. And then they offered me another movie, which was the big, um, uh, I think, Birdcage. Okay. Birdcage. The Dollhouse, Twilight, Birdcage. And then I said, oh, it's tuition. Oh my God. I was making $600 a week. Everyone said, Yeah, because it, uh, and when I was working the three jobs, I was making 150 a week with three jobs. So I said, okay, the movie, this is tuition. I, I can do this for another until I get bitten by a cobra or something. <laughs> the Philippines, so I did a fourth movie. Then, and that was um, uh, Black Mama, White Mama. And they had found out that I was developing a brand of martial arts, a fro, hip hop, a culture that was new. And it was not by any experiment or plan, it was just happening. And so it was becoming very, very popular, and I didn't know that. And my agent, John Gaines, said, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're the movie stay in the theaters forever, they hate you, you know? Which started, by the way, when you had a Steve McQueen movie or a John Wayne movie in the theaters, it didn't stay that long because many of the movies were derivative, they weren't as unique. The music wasn't as great, you know. No one wanted to walk around in John Wayne clothes. So, um, next thing you know, it's like, Pam's, there's music, there's, she's funny, she does martial arts, she's bringing a lot. And the audience were saying, yeah. And next thing you know, my movie was supposed to stay in the theater a week in that one theater in downtown Chicago or LA or wherever, would stay there instead of one week, like two months eight weeks and keep other movies out. John Wayne couldn't get in. And so they said, wow, so we need to develop a multi-theater complex. And so in these big cavernous theaters in the urban in the downtown, we're divided into four or five movie theaters, which become the multiplex. And so now you have 12 of them out in suburbs and places where you can have children's movies, adult movies, martial art movies, a black movie, a hip hop, a Kanye West. You can have all these different types of movies under one roof. It's a lot of popcorn. So out of that necessity came Junior. Oh, here come Rodney. Rodney <laughs> 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 testified. <laughs> going on here. I done walked into Arkansas and it's like, ooh, we gotta tell you about Rodney. <laughs> now there's a lot of Rodneys here. I just want to tell you last night, I said, if I had to drive here, I'd still be outside somewhere, like at a club. But I was downstairs at the bar having these Moscow mules y'all done conjured up on me and stuff. But anyway, how, how, so multiplex theaters came out of movies that stayed too long in a theater in the city. And instead of tearing those big theaters down, they divided them up and people started coming back into the city. <laughs> Inventor, out of, out, of, out of necessity comes genius, right? So that was one good thing that I did. So because of that, we have this today, which is great. And now I can be in different types of movies. I've, and I do animation. I've done Wildcats for J.J.R. Martin. Game of Thrones. Right. I just want to ride a horse, have me covered in mud, and decapitate everyone. That's, <laughs> that's all I want to do. Um, he lives in Santa Fe, and then I did Grand Theft Auto V, Mama G. Because yeah. I'm a gamer, I'm a geek. I still have my first Atari, y'all. <laughs> and I was the one that brought to attention Nintendo. This is a letter from PG, Mama G. You invented the Game Boy, where's the Game Girl? 
Yeah. And it don't have to be pink because I'm fighting with my brothers and my cousins. You know, we're like, they come home and it's all hot and warm and they go, who's been playing my game? <laughs> so I, I always bring balance to life because that's what I was taught from all the different cultures in my family and the industry. And so not only did I do uh, Grand uh, uh, Theft Auto Five, I did um, Scooby Cleopatra, Scooby Doo's Cleopatra, the voice of Cleopatra, and I did um, Shaolin Shuffle. Affinity Ward wrote that for me as well, where I'm this Sifu master, this Kung Fu master that teaches Jay Farrell and all my disciples to kill these zombie rats in New York. That's great. I love zombies. I haven't done my best zombie movie yet, but I hope to. And that was, um, I wanted to do that uh, Scream Blackula Scream. Okay, so. We were ahead. See, I was ahead. We were doing zombie movies ahead. Uh, does anybody in the audience have a question? Uh, yes, uh, you said you had ancestors in Arkansas. Uh, where in Arkansas, do you know where they are? Probably right here in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. I just got shocked over the page, just looking at Arkansas, okay, I'm going there, but I am going to look you up. And so if I'm at your door, I just want dinner, you know, and some beer, we sit down on the, on, the, on the porch in a rocking chair. You know, I come from that kind of stuff, but I've been fortunate to have a military background of urban and DC and rural. So I've learned from a great body of people and cultures. And those cultures allow me to bring to my work because um, when I did the L word, in Vancouver for six years. I didn't know about the LGBT community. And we all have gay relatives and pastors and hairdressers and people who are just great people. And, and, and Native Americans have a, a which are part of 22%. There's two spirit people that were vi very, very valuable and viable in their tribes because the braves would go out and hunt, the buffalo would fall, and then the women and some of the elders would go out and render the buffalo or whoever fell, the animals that fell, and then back home at the teepee and, and where the, the, the residence was, they were doing the laying of the grass dance before they asked permission to build teepee on grass that's gently stepped on in a circle. So they build their teepee. And at the, at, the, at the Council of Teepees, you had the two spirit people who could de decorate, take care of the kids, and cook. And they were highly valuable to any tribe. They weren't ostracized, brutalized, or attacked. They were embraced. Matter of fact, you want as many two, two spirit people in your family to make sure your family is taken care of. So they didn't, we didn't have that, I didn't grow up not including or hating or discriminating against bisexual, homosexual, or transgender people. We were just a different embrace of everyone. And our neighbors, we had a Chinese family called the Chin family that were ranchers in Wyoming. My grandmother in Wyoming had uh, a hotel for the blacks and Chinese that worked on the railroad, a la Blazing Saddles. Um, I gave that information to Richard Pryor, who was writing it with Mel Brooks, <laughs> to give him some authenticity. He said, really? I said, yeah, there was Mary Fields, the first black stagecoach driver, and Annie Oakley, and Calamity Jane, and Bill Hancock, a bunch of crazy people back then. <laughs> and my grandmother also had, great grandma had a mama, look, Lucy Davis, you know, on my Twitter, uh, she had a 200 acre sugar beet farm. She was a woman of means, and she wasn't married. She was looking for her body. <laughs> but she had Uncle Joe in the barn. He, he was Native American, had a long white braid, and he was her handyman. She was very handy, I love him. But anyway, um, so I, I grew up with that, and I brought it to film. And I think that's what gave me a 50-year career. And so there's a lot of actresses today, I, I'm hoping they reach back into you know, their culture and their, their spirit and their people. There's so much around us to write about. 
you know, I, I've written, matter of fact, the producer of the Diane Keaton film, she's producing Foxy, my autobiography, but she also wants me to direct it. I just so happen to have my screenplays written. <laughs> One called Fried Chicken Chronicles, it's, go, it's awesome. I'm gonna direct that, but I also wanna direct a, pro, a process of, that I've written about women in, in Africa who have to be hidden in these sanctuaries from the, the, their religious dogma that wants to annihilate their genitals. If they can't bear children, they'll be stoned to death to free the husband to remarry. And so these group of women um, uh, are, are, are fabulous leader, fearless leader um, of Ms. Magazine who put me on the cover, went there, and out of it came this incredible story of how do you get these women to the sanctuary that's guarded before their husbands get them and kill them. It's a fascinating story. It's, it's, it's riveting. And it's triumphant and it's sad and it's real. But it's an interesting story that we're not familiar with that I think people will see, not judges go, ooh, it's, this is an interesting story. We have so many freedoms here, let's not take this for granted. And it makes us, you know, have empathy. Bill keeps our empathy so that we're not desensitized. Okay. okay. Uh, and so, you have a script for that, you're gonna try to direct it? <coughs> I, 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 sometimes you think you can direct what you've written and sometimes it's so emotional you don't know if you can. So I'll know that. Okay. I'll know that. All right, so uh, I was will, you, will you be there to support me? Yeah. Uh, hey, if you, if you want to have me on the set anytime, I'll be there. I'll, you heard it. For you. you heard it. You're probably my cousin, so don't even worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask about when you did Fort Apache, the Bronx. Um, you talked about how you, uh, in order to get into the role, you actually went and did a tour of. Uh, What's oh, you're just going on? all emotional. I'm glad I didn't drink. I'd <laughs> <laughs> be crying and like, go ahead, finish. Well, I was gonna ask, like, what, what was uh, your experience with uh, actually meeting some sex workers and, and sort of seeing how they live? It was, was like? wow. Um, I don't know if you've been around um, the sexual, you know, adult trade. Been uh, and you probably wouldn't admit it anyway. So, mm. but um, to do my research. I, they had, uh, David Susskind, Paul Newman, uh, uh, the actor, and Woody Gould, and the director, Daniel Petrie, had contacted me and said, Pam, um, you're one of the actresses that is not afraid of nudity. You've owned it, and it's very courageous, and you really bring that to a female role. And I didn't know how to take that. I said, well, thank you, you know, it prepared me you know, for life because I have been attacked and, you know, I don't have as much fear because I've had the experience. So they said, we, we want you to come in and audition for Charlotte, this character who is a, a um, prostitute and a drug addicted and she wants to die. She wants someone to kill her because she's too incompetent to kill herself. So I'm going, wow, I don't know. Uh, drug addicted, that's a lot of research. And so, and I said, well, well, who, they, they said, we've looked at everyone. And I, and I, everyone, every black actress had come in, but it's a role that is scary. It's like, to do the work, you gotta be in. And I said, how long are you giving me to prepare for this? And, and they said, can you come in like in two days? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in New York? Uh, I said, you know, first thing I thought of was past. Just, I don't want to make a fool of myself in front of Paul Newman. Mm. And they said, no, Pam, we think you can do it. Because if you're courageous enough to show your body on film and then, you know, kind of trick, trick these guys, these bad guys, so you can kill them, that takes a lot. That's Matahari, that's spies, that's CIA, that's a lot of them. And, <sighs> How much you pay? I said, I don't know. And so I looked at the script and I said, oh my God, no wonder anyone who's preparing for this is going to have nightmares. 
I said, how do you prepare for this? You have to go meet hookers. You have to go to a, a, a drug center. You have to look at lots of film. You have to figure out, and I don't, I, 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 I've fallen out at my, my debutante ball from drinking too much, but I don't know how to, you know, literally fell out at my debutante ball. Um, I don't know how to do a heroin addict. I have, I need, I need time. No wonder no one, it, it, it's, I said, I, I don't know if I can do this. And so my agent said, just, just try. Just, you're, you're a student, because I was always a student and I studied very well. I said, I, I'll need therapy after this. This is, this is a tough role. So I said, okay, we're gonna fly you in and we want you to come to the Men's Coffee Theater and we want you to you know, just do the audition. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I don't know why I said yes. You know how someone said, hey, make me. Okay. <laughs> um, so I flew there. I had no clothes. I just said, I'm gonna go in, do the audition and leave. I'm not gonna bring clothes because I'm not gonna get it. It's gonna be too, this is gonna be tough to play a drug addicted killer who kills with razor blades and I'm gonna kill somebody with razor blades and eyes. They said, how'd you do that? I don't know. Um, secret. So <laughs> I go there and I'm at the Wyndham Hotel. I clear out the entire room of furniture. I eat a cherry pie for three days, no other food. The sugar would bring me up and drop me down and put black circles around my eyes. And, and I, I, Miguel Pinheiro said, Pam, I want to take you to a shooting gallery. And I thought it was like, you know, shooting gallery. <laughs> he says, no, we're going to Avenue A, B, C. It's, we're going to see, I'll take you. You know, we have to have a letter in our pocket so if they find our bodies, they know where to send it. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? What? He says, yeah, because we're doing research and someone could kill us. This is very dangerous. I'm like, Miguel <laughs> Pinheiro, who later died. He wrote his short eyes. He's a fantastic actor in before Apache de Bronx. So we go to a shooting gallery. Let's see, hypodermics, a dollar fifty, needles, uh, syringes, all I want. And people of all walks of life are sitting on mattresses all over the floor and sofas, high, strung out, completely out. And if you want drugs, talk to the manager. I'm going, oh my gosh, this is is this legal? You know? And it was like, oh, no, he says, no, we're not supposed to be here. We could die. Oh, thank you. So I'm looking at this, and then he says, I'm going to take you over to 9th and 10th Avenue. There's some ladies that want to talk to you. And he's like, I'm going, we go over the air. It's the trucking industry, and there's people, women servicing. People, all, I'm like, okay, this is, I'm seeing it. I'm feeling it. I'm crying. There's a woman that I talked to. She's going to put herself to college doing this and it's dangerous and she may, at any night she may not come home. They might find her in pieces in a river or something. I'm like, oh my God, you're 12, remember? And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, I have to say gosh in front of you. So I get all this information and I say, okay, how am I gonna look? What do these other actresses look like? What do they do? So um, I found a wig shop on 42nd Avenue. It was a, a shop uh, for gays, men, and I found these shoes and outfits, and they I put together my shower with a blonde wig and cut a skirt up, and I got started working without sleeping for three days in, in, my, in my suite, and uh, I put it all together, a monologue of this character, and I was, we went to the, with the sugar Jones and no sleep and I was stumbling and I let my hair grow on my legs and on my arm because I didn't shave. And I decided not to bathe. It would suit the character because where she was living in a, in a, 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 a abandoned home, she wasn't showering, she wasn't clean. So, you know, when you do the work, when you're auditioning, you live that character. You might stink and you may not brush your teeth, but if that's the character, that's what you do. So when you go in to meet, you're so authentic to the director and the producers, short of saying, hey, um, I, I'm sorry I didn't bathe, you don't have to apologize because they expect you not to bathe. Because that's a part of your craft. You get up in the morning and you go out and you kill people and you don't take a shower and freshen up. So I um, get dressed up, suited up. The manager knows what I've been doing because he said, Okay, you're not eating food. You haven't ordered food in three days. And when he saw the room, he says, where's the furniture? It was all pushed up against the wall because that was my stage. And uh, I walked down the hallway, open, elevator door opens. There's Carol Burnett. 
she looked at me, grabbed her purse, went, oh, and I remember her, her, uh, uh, and then I, I almost came out of character to say, I love your work, kid. Oh my God. She says, don't hurt me. <laughs> and then she immediately got off the elevator and I said, I want to go to an audition with Paul Newman. She said, you'll get it. <laughs> she was so glad to get off that elevator. Carol <laughs> Burnett, come on. I watched your show forever. And I was like, you want to get silly and stupid? But I said, no, I'm sure. <laughs> so I went through the elevator. I got off on the first floor and people started looking at me. And the manager said, <laughs> and I said, you look great, you look great. And so I go, oh, thanks, baby, I'll see you back here. Because I haven't been go just shit. You know, I'm not, I just don't know if I can prove that I'm this unclean killer who wants to die and who kill. I don't know. So I says, hey, you can, you can get it. And you can have the script. So I walk out. Turn left, go down Avenue Americas, and people are watching this hooker, drugged, drunk, weaving. And I'm like, hey, what's And guys are saying, hey, hey, yo, mira, mira, hey, money, money, money. And I'm like, uh, and I'm like, and I'm walking down the street, I got three blocks to go, and I get there without being arrested. And of course, pulls over a black, a blue and white New York car, police car. Hey, where you doing? I said, I'm going to an audition. He says, Sure, you are. I'm like, No, really, don't arrest me now. Uh, Paul Newman, I'm at the precinct. Can you come get me? I was arrested for being so convincing. And, and I said, No, really, seriously. I said, Okay. He said, You need it? I said, No, I need to walk down the street and get prepared. That's my preparation. And they go, Okay. So, and then they said, Hey, Maybe uh, after we get off, I said, get the f you know, <laughs> you're hitting on me. You know, I, my legs are too skinny to hit on me. I got them bird legs from running. Them. I got them real thin legs where your kneecaps are bigger than your calves. So uh, I walk on down the street and everybody's like hitting on me and two women are going, ugh, and the guys are going, ugh. And so I said, it's working. I might have, so I get to the men's cough reception and there's a sister there. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm Pam Green. I'm here to meet with David Susco. And she looked at me and she said, no, you ain't. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Trust, I am Pam Green. She said, no, you ain't. I said, please just let me into the office. They'll kick me out if they don't let me in. And, and she said, so, I said, give me your movies. What's your favorite thing? Call me Dr. Green. She said, Oh my God, you are hot. <laughs> oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm auditioning, remember? <laughs> oh, well, go right on up. <laughs> oh my goodness. Paul <laughs> <laughs> Shanae. <laughs> And so I go on up the elevator and stuff and go to the next receptionist. Uh, I am a Pam Green Green Artist for Paul Newman Dave Sister. What? I'm Pam Green. I'm here to audition. She goes, she said, I don't want to do this movie. Just did by looking crazy. And I'm going, just tell me to go, oh yeah, you do. Okay, I'll be right back. And so I'm standing there and she says, you want to sit down where? I want to say, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sick of y'all. This is, this is way too long for an audition. <laughs> I'm tired of this. So they say, okay, he's ready to see you. So Woody go go swings over the Hey Pam, how are you? The Valley dude, right? Hey, nice to see you. How's your trip? You're like, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just do this? This is killing me for to do this for three days. You know, and I said, Oh, okay, okay. I said, I said, Are you ready? I said, Yeah. He said, Here's a script. I don't need a script. Just sit. so he sat down, opened up the script, and Paul Newman's like, right there, Paul Newman. 
he was scared to touch me. <laughs> I had faith. I think they smelled me before they saw me. And then Dave discussed kind of, and Dan Petrie and stuff like, and Van, Daniel Petrie's son did Beverly Hills Cop, you know, so they were familiar with it. And they said, oh, I said, this, this, don't. You don't want to break all the work to talk about your air trip, your flight. You know, how's the room, how's the hotel, the food, everyone treating you. Shut up. You know, so so I, I didn't even sit. I was just in the short skirt, halter top, blonde wig, loud makeup, red platform shoes, red stockings and garters, okay? I think that's what made everyone crazy. <laughs> it's a garter belt with people are going, what's a garter belt? You know, they wear Spanx now, no one wears them anymore. So anyway, I, uh, we start the process. We start reading and it's like, oh, he can't even read. I'm off book. <laughs> and so I have to touch, I have to do things to him. I can't, she's here. Anyway, so I, um, he drops the script and he's like, and he's gonna pick it up. He says, oh, I said, oh just add lib. You wrote it, fool. You should know. You know, and so we do the scene, we do that, the, all the, the whole things we're supposed to do. And Paul and I'm gonna scoot to the edge of the sofa. And they're all looking at me. And I can feel my knees like, and I'm sorry, like, if one of you move one more time, I'm gonna hurt you. You don't go. You're not in this room, okay? So we finish the scene. I I shoot up. I collapse, fall on the ground, and it was all of a sudden there's this applause, and I didn't even know I grabbed Woody's crotch, <laughs> <laughs> and I killed him with razor blades in my teeth, and they thought it was brilliant. So they plotted, plot, 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 and I and I looked around and I went. And Paul said, you got the job. This is the best performance I've ever seen. And I was like, wow, thank you. I'm so tired. I've been for three days, wearing this outfit for three days. I haven't bathed in three days. Thank you. And they said, you got the job. We're starting tomorrow. I'm like, I don't have any clothes. I didn't have any And I said, can I call my mom and tell her that I got this? You know, that I'm your perfect junkie and, and, and like a prostitute? Ho, street walker, you name it. And, and she was so excited. Paul talked to her on the phone. He said, yeah, your daughter just gave us a great performance. She's crazy as a bed bug. And, and we call it crazy as a June bug, but he said bed bug that over. I didn't mark her. And, and they said, well, I said, I need to go home and get, and stuff, where do you live? They said, I said, no, I live in Colorado. Colorado. <laughs> I know, I ski, I'll kind of tell you, it's a long story. So anyway, they sent me home, I come back and I'm working with all these incredible people. Um, and uh, in, in the Fort Apache of the Bronx, there's an area where you had to walk on the street because the people were so dangerous, they would throw hot water off of you, uh, out of their windows onto you if you walked on the sidewalk. So it was a really extreme place. It was a wonderful experience working with Paul Newman. He wanted to work with me again. But when you prepare for a role, you are that character. You know, you you, you, know, you got to pluck your eyebrows. You got to put wounds on you. You don't bathe. You you have a hangover. You smell like alcohol. That's you have to do that. And when we're shooting a film, we get the a cold or flu or funeral. They don't let us go home. We we're tied to the whole production, and, and no one can go. Hundred thousand people. All those people at the set can't go home because you you got a funeral or you're sick. So unless you're in the hospital with a, with a broken arm like George Clooney, you know, riding a motorcycle into a car, I don't know how it did 20 miles an hour. I'd be running faster than that. <laughs> so um, anyway, anyway, um, that's a part of the work that I got, and that's part of my brand, because they know Pam's not going to do just anything. And what I do, I want to prepare, because you're actually living and being another person. So I, I think... You, I couldn't play at being a prostitute. I couldn't play. I had seen it. I didn't, you know, go out and sell my body. I don't think I'd earn enough anyway. But I just had to be as close as possible. And when I did the L word, I found out that there were actresses that couldn't kiss Jennifer Beals, even though they thought they could, but they couldn't kiss another woman. And when I had kissed um, this character named Poppy, who, by yeah. the way, is Meghan Markle's best friend, <laughs> Janina, yeah. you know, and Poppy. And when I kissed her, and everyone said, well, are you, were you turned on to her? 
did you become gay because you kissed another woman? I said, no. What was it like kissing Janina? Well, kind of like my German Shepherd. <laughs> my German Shepherd's tongue is bigger and she's fuzzier, but I didn't find, I didn't, I knew I wasn't attracted to her or gay because it didn't, you didn't have that natural, the bells and the things. Yeah. You know, I just, Rodney just, you know, sat next, was standing next to me and there were bells. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been around football players and I just did like this and I went, oh, pow, wow. Oh, no, uh-uh, I -uh, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, no, I'm, I'm good, I'm done. And so, but you can tell something innate, something that's internal, your DNA. And they just thought, well, she's so pretty, you sure you weren't turned on to her? I said, no, it's like looking at the same thing. You know, I got the same thing as she got. What? A, that's not, that's, I don't turn myself on. You know, I, all of this is not funny. It's not fun. It's like, you know, the cramps used to just drive me crazy. Okay? And then, and then to have now at 69, with, with a seven hour orgasm, it's no fun. I, I have to make sure I'm in great shape. If I ever even think of, of dating again, you know, it's like, oh, why can there be those five and 10 minutes? You know, those quick, it's not that anymore when you get over, it's longer. I don't know why. I would love to do a study or a movie on it at least. But anyway, so the experiences that I had, because with the LGBT community, and I work at Subaru is my corporate sponsor, and every year we host Dining Out for Life for one day, and all the restaurants donate their entire take to organizations locally for people who are living with HIV AIDS because you can't get a job, you can't ride a bus, you can't live in an apartment. So we found corporations and people who help people who are living with it. And a lot of people, they're just not all gay, they're not all black, and they're not all women. There was a psychologist who had a great practice. Her, her boyfriend bring, gives her AIDS, she loses her job, her, she's lived sleeping in her car. And this organization found, in Houston, found a place where she could get back on her feet, live in an apartment, take the bus, and have, and her family left her they, because she had HIV AIDS. She yeah. lost everything. So there's, education is important. Uh, funding is important. We have all our issues and we take care of them. We manage them when we talk about them. We, we, we're really good managers. I'm not the best, but I get out there and I try. And I have all, I, mean, I rescue horses and train them for a therapy writing program. Um, I, I, I have, children that that don't get food and i know that they're not getting it and i make sure that hey come on over and do your homework until your parents get home because i don't want them in the house by themselves they, they get into trouble nor do are they around a family environment and it's not like i have a husband and kids and dogs and stuff but it's a it's a cozy place where everyone's sitting at the table and how was school today so, and I also go around to all of the, a lot of the pastors, there's more schools and churches, and I ask the churches to open up their churches during the week for after school study programs, so that they can give the seniors an opportunity to come back in the work or to volunteer and tutor and help the kids study, which is really important. That's what we do. We manage better than anybody else that we vote for or we put out there. And if they can't do the job, we will. And if we have to do it, then we'll take that money we pay in you and put it in our communities. Yeah. And I, I, I do it what I can in the smallest way, but I am part of our community and I'm a part of sharing my wonderful 50 year career with you. And he got one question out or two, and he, you had one. Any other questions quickly? With okay. okay, let's start with uh, you. I think I saw your hand in the back first. So. With uh, playing your voice, yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, all right. Um, I saw online that you were in a movie called Women in Cages. I think it was the nineties and seventies. Yes. Everything I did was his inspiration. He has a vision. He has a vision. Anything to keep from doing the dishes.
dishes. He loved me. And, I, and we're, we're each other's muse. But yes, when I started that with Roger Corman, he was a very equal and allowing women gender issue to be equal on film. So there were nurses who were bikers, women who were bikers. We were in prison. We equalized. We whistled at men. We, you know, we were abusive to them as well. You know, like, so, um, we, so he, they, they, you know, were playing with women being equal. And Quentin liked that, and so did Brian De Palma, so did John Carpenter. By the way, it was on John Carpenter's movie, Escape from L.A. I was a woman, girl, woman, playing a man, playing a woman. Oh, and yeah. it, you, you see that? Yeah. 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 And you're going to love this audition. <laughs> um, oh, you know me and my auditions now. So John calls me, and he's going to pay me very money. He says, Pam, I want you to play Kurt Russell's a film, you know, Carjack Malone. I'm like, He's a guy. Oh, okay, you want me to play? And I'll play you very well. You're gonna pay me very well. Okay, and you wanna be a guy? Well, okay, so, but I want you to be pretty and play a guy. Okay, so I'm a woman being a guy, being a woman, trying to be pretty. Hershey loves Palmas? Okay, all right, heading. <laughs> what do I do here? I would love to work with John Carpenter. He, you know, I go from theater to, humor to John Carpenter. I want to do everything and experience everything and everybody and all the culture and all the cult and pop. So I go, okay, hmm, Pam Greer makeup, denim blouse, leggings, combat boots. I don't have enough beard or mustache, so I'll have to put one on. It might come off in the sweat and makeup. Armpit hair, like how do I be a man? How do I be Kurt? Oh gosh. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Okay, I got it. I got it. So I'm gonna look like RuPaul with a sock in my leggings. Okay. And the sock flattened out. Oh shoot, it's not working. I can't keep stuffing, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Okay, zucchini. I've got to find a good zucchini. And I put it in my leggings. And I, okay, I drive over to Warner Brothers, go through the lot. Hey Pam, how you doing? It's not working, I look like Pam Greer. And so I get out of the car, park, walk to John's office. I got a cute, I got this wonderful zucchini. You guys will never eat it again. Um, so I have this zucchini in my leggings. And so I'm going, hey, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 hey. And to the crew members, hey, yeah, y'all walking with John. Hey. And so this guy says, hey, God, that guy really looks like Pam Greer. <laughs> <laughs> So you gotta put on the, the swag, huh? You know, to be so. That's what you do. Keep from doing the dishes. Well, thank you so much. I think we're out of time. So. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no.